Life is full of opportunities to condemn, condemn others for what we experience as transgressions. How can we infuse more compassion and kindness into our lives? The kind of kindness, forgiveness, thoughtfulness, and compassion we offer children. I have noticed there can be a major discrepancy in the way we offer children larger boundaries to flounder in error with impunity. Why do we stymie these conditions for adults? It is erroneous to assume the maturation process has yielded an individual skilled at taking into consideration the needs of others and navigating in a manner that makes the most optimal sense. Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That is a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. Dale Carnegie. Recently, the past six years of my life have been filled with many of these opportunities, and to say I have skillfully navigated them is a poor assertion. I have struggled immensely with establishing healthy boundaries. All suffer in some manner, some greater, more extant, or overt. Do the suffering not require love and care too? It is not as easy. It's not. A, it is not an easy choice to care for the suffering. It is easier to discard and extricate from these types of interactions. But I ask, who is perfect? Who does not suffer and who does not deserve love? To properly love and support others requires immense resolute and counseling. If the correct supports are not in place, they cause many micro-traumas that aggregate into a larger trauma. A journey towards your freedom from suffering might arrive from the liberation of responding to others negatively because of their suffering and doing the following, asking questions, not condemning, and offering support. As with any practice, there is no final destination and it is ongoing. It is filled with many mistakes and failures, one of life's greatest teachers. Okay, today everybody, we are going to explore suffering and supporting others. And uh, I'm talking to uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, greatest uh, life teachers, life uh, life coaches. Um, uh, can you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Darlene Zimmerman. You can find me on Facebook at Darlene Zim, Z-I-M-M, and at Metanoa Healing Arts on both Instagram and Facebook. Cool. And you're talking to uh, Lex Peters. I am from Motion Design Studio. You can find me at Motion Design Studio on Facebook. You can find me at Motion Design Studio on Instagram and YouTube. All right. So where do we start, Darlene? Um, I think uh, you have, uh, you, first of today, when we first started this conversation, you asked me some really important questions that I find, that I found really challenging, and I couldn't really come up with, mm -hmm. uh, with any really good answers to them, and uh, I thought that uh, it would be great to try to explore this a bit with you, um, and I think that during, during this exploration process, um, we can really begin to, to uh, decipher a little bit more how uh, these types of uh, uh, pathologies uh, pop up in 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 in, um, in children and, and continue to like grow and gain more momentum in adults and then the kind of ways that uh, what are some of the best ways we can try to like you know head on approach uh, these conflicts so um, the first one of the questions you asked me earlier today is um, um, who is we in the offering the love and tenderness um, to children all right so when I say we, that was your question, by the way. Um, when I say, mm -hmm. right, um, who is the we? Okay, so the we for me in that question tends to be uh, individuals that we, individuals or groups that we f praise for the way that they construct um, interactions with um, with younger with with children and uh, in an attempt to create a better, healthier, more well-adjusted individuals. Um, th th that's that's who I was referring to when I say uh, uh, we um, and offering love and tenderness to children. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 
And that was in my, I had responded to you because you mentioned you hated harming others and you want to treat others with love and tenderness that is offered to children. Yes. And then I ask you who that we was because I personally have seen many times that there is not love and tenderness offered to children. And then I also challenged on what do what does loving responses look like to children because, and which leads to the next questions I gave you. Yeah. Um, at what point is a loving response to create consequences for some poor behavior they had? Well, an observer like looking in on it might say, wow, that's really harsh, um, and you don't understand what the child has done, and it can appear like it's not a loving action, but you may actually be having a very loving action because you're trying to ensure long-term success for them. Like, you cannot hit your brother or sister, or you can't push them. You cannot push them from a space where they can fall and harm themselves or be killed. Um, and there might be some harsher circumstances for that, um, which is why I was coming along with the question, at what point do we paralyze and, and enable children when we allow them to mistreat others? And when that punishment does happen sometimes on the surface, it may not appear as the most loving thing that they, you know, get sent to their room for an evening or a day or whatever that looks like, depending on how extreme their actions were. Um, so, yeah, I challenge you with that. <laughs> yeah, I, so I was thinking more about, as I thought more about it, what came to mind, um, it's the... Uh, the possibility that you know we when we when we kind of construct models of um, um, to respond to what we would consider um, transgressions in a way that you know we would say like a collectively whatever the cultural zeitgeist says um, for that culture uh, that we are embedded in says like these are some ways that we should probably respond that is best in regards to addressing. Um, um, you know those any type of transgression that we might experience from from anyone um, but but there's a moment right when <laughs> if we take a, because we don't have access to like um, easily do brain scans on everyone we, we we we're slightly taken at best I guess at the individual to say that okay they might be what we consider statistically normal enough right that their behavior is considered normal and then th since their behavior is normal enough, these are some responses to shape the behavior or encourage behavior. I don't know, shape, shaping might seem um, like too uh, manipulative for some people, um, but, but at the end of the day, you are still shaping behavior. But should I say encourage behavior uh, from an intrinsic perspective to do something that, well, that looks like a little bit more like a healthier individual? Now, now that would work well if the individual that you're dealing with, the child, is um, is able to respond in a way that, that that that's fairly within the parameters of what we would consider a normal, healthy child. But what if you have a child that is like an, uh, you know, has has literally like a, a, a damaged brain of some sort, you know, that you don't know, mm -hmm. and then here you are trying to implement these um, th these ideas about um, how one can be better in the world and try to teach these things as intrinsic um, behavior pattern and that really are not going to really work because you're dealing with someone that that's not their their brain is not properly structured to receive that and respond in a way that that makes sense and 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 I say I say structured because I think this is what it's really important right when we look at like brain structure itself on a developmental level right we can probably say that they're safe it's safe to say that we can see uh, abnormalities that cause like uh, what looks like uh, psychopathologies we can also um, an individual as they get older based on the, the amount of trauma the type of trauma they have the coping mechanisms in place to try to address those types of traumas can also yield a very very um, yield very destructive neuropathways and you know what I've noticed right with my experiences with individuals that are to me they feel that it feels as if their their response mechanisms are slightly disproportionate in a way that it looks like trauma to me and the trauma is invisible to that individual or it's something that it's uncomfortable for them to actually acknowledge um, they end up um, just uh, 
being very um, destructive. And, and, and if you take that destructive behavior and the lack of self-reflection and you combine it with someone that's fairly intelligent, they're particularly adroit at defending the, the, their, 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 their psychosis. Um, you know, so I don't really know where you move. How do you move forward from that that space? Um, yeah. Good question. How to deal with a pathological emotion manipulator? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> you described. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, well, I mean, that's what I'm talking to you. This is this is something that you know. I feel that <laughs> your expertise and experiences will definitely, um, you know, your your area of epistemology will definitely. Um, give me give us a little bit bring a little leverage a little bit more insight into types of behavior patterns around this so yes uh, can you say it again because that was a bit of a mouthful for the readers for me for the listeners so i said what was described was pathological emotional manipulation okay or or emotional manipulation it might not be like completely pathological and there's varying degrees of it in different kinds i use like a general boon term like the pathological emotional manipulation because it can show up in a lot of ways. It can show up in codependency, it can show up in narcissism. Um, there's just many ways that people try to manipulate their environment around them using other people's emotions to try and control their behavior. And some people, I mean, we all do it to some degree, and the more we become aware of it, the more we can start changing our behavior to move more consciously. Uh, some people don't change that behavior. That's just their way of operating in the world, and it may become so extreme that they are aware of it and they know how to use it well to get what they want from the world in a way that is harmful to the people around them, and they may reach to the point where they don't care, and that's when you start getting into, like, antisocial personality disorders and actual, like, NPD, which is narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah, does that answer your question better? <laughs> sure, I think it might create more. As with any proper inquiry, you know, you ask questions mm-hmm. and you ask, you end up with more questions. You know, um, yes. yeah, I, 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 I'm not really, I'm not really. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we can back up just a little bit. Did I even slightly uh, bring a little bit more uh, of a um, clarity to 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 my? Um, my level of like analysis of uh, how do we um, get to a point where we actually accurately make assessment about individuals and their condition and then possibly okay. support them in a way that makes sense you know I, I I think I was I was a little bit all over the place where um, I was I didn't I don't want to present my argument too much from the argument of exception you know I'm not sure how many people are out there with <laughs> thank you i wasn't sure you know I, I don't want to like present this as a you know like argument from exception fallacy where i'm like utilizing the you know a smaller portion of individuals with, with you know obvious physical brain damage that are just difficult individuals to deal with um i'm not really sure what that looks like and then again and also i'm not really sure if i can actually accurately say that um just the type of the conditions that we live in right now, and uh, for any listeners out there, uh, I'm, I'm talking about um, the culture of America. The Greater Northeast is uh, America is where uh, the majority of my uh, um, cognitive experiences have 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 resided. So, um, you know, take that for what it is. It's it's a limited data set, and it's going to give me a very um, a colloquial result if I were to measure it. Not to say it's applicable to all parts of the planet, but all conversations and all individuals are limited in regards to what we can experience and our data set defines our reality. So I have experienced quite a bit of individuals in this part of uh, the United States of America that definitely suffer greatly from like um, um, uh, traumas and, 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 um, and, and, and the need, my interest in wanting to interact, re- interact with them has not waned even though they are uh, difficult individuals like i i'm still very much there with them you know and and um in doing so it creates a bit of problems for me you know like for one thing um um, as i alluded in my opener um i ended up with a quite a bit of trauma 
um, you know, and it was it was a lot of like small traumas that that, that happened over a lot long period of time that uh, created a larger trauma, and 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 now I feel like I'm just a big trauma sponge, you know, and what I didn't do properly. Um, is that I didn't have uh, the proper amounts of supports in place to help me um, process my experiences to help uh, me not end up um, feeling, uh, um, you know, not ending up with uh, my own personal traumas from being supportive and being caring of others, you know. Um, right. So yeah, I I, I think. I, th- I kind of went off again, um, but uh, to go back to what I was saying is I just really don't know who you're dealing with when the person in front of you um, is, is, is causing some turmoil. You know, I don't really, we don't really know who they are. What, what, what's their story? What's their narrative? We can't look at their brain. We don't have a brain scan we have access to immediately. We just don't know. And all we can do is create these kind of um, responses that we learn over time that you know, instead of yelling, instead of physically causing harm to somebody, we try to do other things. You know, to 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 get to a place that is, um, uh, 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 you know, more respite for for both participants. Mm-hmm. So, what you're trying to figure out is like a solution on how to deal with it. Yes, absolutely. Am I understanding correctly? Yes. Okay. Yeah, like the first thing that I would offer with that is being able to understand your own brain and trauma well so that you can understand your responses if you're triggered. Um, So if you're in the space of... Sorry, I'm echoing really badly right now. I don't want to, like... Stop. Okay. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) I I don't know if you can cut that out. It's, like, really bad. No. Is it Um, still doing it? Yeah, I'm good now. Okay, okay. I don't know why I was doing it. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Nope, it's back. Um, so, being able to, t- to realize in the moment that your limbic system may be going, maybe maybe having, you're, you're struggling processing, processing things in the moment, it's a good idea to step back and be able to allow your cognitive self to take over to process so you're less easily... Um, swayed or like having your limbic system triggered in a way that just escalates things. I think that's a really the first the first step, like one of the most important things to do when dealing with something like that. And then also maybe seeking help <laughs> and asking other people for help or a therapist or a coach. Is that answering your question a little better? Yes. Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, and then, as far as, like, you can't, I mean, I guess you could ask someone to be like, I think you're acting a little strange right now. You should get a MRI of your brain. <laughs> that probably wouldn't work well. <laughs> no, it sounds like a, an aggressive comment. <laughs> yes, and, and then you've afforded. So, I mean, a lot of us will never have a scan of our brain to know if it's normal, whatever that normal looks like. <laughs> sure. So, yes. A little comedy relief. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny you say what normal looks like because um, th- that definitely changes like per culture, per region. You know, you are often, uh, you know, one of the most important things that happened to me in my, uh, along my, um, you know, my, my um, journey to colonize my brain was when I discovered um, cultural anthropology, I mean, sorry, uh, cross-cultural psychology. It was kind of like the the key to a lot of questions that I had about um, things that I was studying, things that I experienced, and and just the general experience of words themselves. You know, so normal being one of them. Um, you know, are, are you know what is normal, right? We we tend to look at when we look based on where you are in the world and the experiences that you you have. Uh, academically, you know, you end up with like, particularly an American um, citizen. You're probably going to, um, be, you're going to be very much influenced by a lot of like uh, Western psychology, whether you like it or not. It's in, it's embedded in in the culture in so many ways, you know. So that Western psychology and that perspective defines what normal looks like um, for 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 its 
for its denizens. Um, it doesn't mean that, that that's the same normal for everyone, you know, and I feel once you understand that, then you start to approach the conversation a little bit more cautiously versus like establishing so much certainty about what what is normal. Um, but it's not a it's not an easy thing to sell, you know. I mean, we want certainty in life. Um, to 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 have a conversation to to end up at the conclusion that there is no conclusion is not really that appealing to many people. Um, yeah. y you know, we we want certainty, and and I feel that <laughs> it kind of like tends to like match our the the or the human experience where we are. We are limited, right? So we're going to eventually cease to exist in the way that we define our life at this moment, right? Um, in, in the carbon-based life form of our, when that ceases, using that definition not to enter into an esoteric, um, um, uh, you know, spiritual, like, uh, when does life begin and end discourse, but um, the, the, the carbon-based biological termination of ourselves, right? Because of that, it we need to also have conclusions that that match that they tend to be reflective of us like we we need to come to a conclusion because we're going to eventually conclude and we need to have conclusions that also answers to that that end up at, as as conclusions so it, it it makes sense i mean if we were indefinite um in 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 a non um dualistic perspective uh, um then sure we would continue to pursue and ask and realize that the ideas, the things that we hold ourselves so certain to, are very much um, uh, isolated to, I mean, I'm sorry, their ongoing um, exploration of the world as we know it. Um, so yeah, I don't know, what is normal? Well, it depends on where you are, uh, how many people feel the same way that you do. Um, what is the social norms that, that, that kind of govern uh, the behavior of others around you? Um, what is acceptable within those social norms? Uh, the, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, all, that, that, that's, that's really what normal is, you know? I got it. Yeah. I, I like that. That's a great explanation. Um, yeah. I think with that normal, I think I guess what we talk about when we're talking about the normal, it's like we're making generalizations of things that we're observing in the world. And sometimes those generalizations can be helpful, but they're not usually good to make like very strong assertions with. So, either. Yeah. Right. So, so, so how does normal. that, right, so how does, how does that kind of like go back to um, when we are, um, engaged with people that are challenging or causing us um, harm, right? You know, why, why should we, why should we not, why should we not offer them more areas of, of, of more space, more compassion, you know, instead of just like um, writing them off or extricating ourselves from from the interaction, you know, to, like what, 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 you know, why not offer that to those individuals? Because I see that there are moments when we probably should remove ourselves and should shut down, but I'm not really sure exactly when those moments should happen, you know, and I think that's really the source of this conversation. I'm trying to like get a little closer at discovering for, for myself and hopefully for others. Yeah, I, I guess that would like come down to your threshold of what you what you're willing to experience and what you're not, you know, like your hard limits of like what is too too damaging to my emotional, physical, or mental health, which they all tie together. Um, and each person's threshold for that is a little different. Um, and then we, you know, we have a lot of Western psychology and stuff that tries to define, you know, where is that threshold of what healthy looks like. And that can be debatable on some level. <laughs> so yeah, I guess a good question to start asking it yourself is um, where where's your threshold? What are your hard boundaries? What are boundaries that you're softer on? What do you what is what do you choose to do when those get violated? Um, when is too much too much? And I think that's going to vary a lot from person to person. Yes. 
boy, and that just makes things even more complicated because, you know, my threshold could be something greater or less than another person's, right? And then uh, another person observing my um, threshold and my interactions with another might think that it's strange and silly for me to, to, to extend myself um, too, too much, too much, or they might perceive that my extension of myself is too much, you know? And I, I, I can safely say that um, I don't really have a, I don't have a great, I don't have a great, I, I don't have a really solid idea as to like when to stop, you know? I feel, again, and, and I'll say this with some redundancy, that there are many opportunities to just try to continue to um, support others through their difficulties. And I have not um, met a perfect person yet in my life, you know. I've met so many people that do odd things and mm -hmm. destructive things. And I, I have not met one person, including myself, that that don't have those tendencies. And I'm like saying to myself, well, well, well when do we shut them down, you know? I, I mean... <laughs> I don't know, you know. I, I really just don't know what that that I don't know what that looks like. Right. So I want to, and I want to come back with the the you know that thing that um, no one's perfect. It's very obvious, none of us are perfect, and we can't even really define what perfect looks like. Um, that would be kind of like some of the other things we talked about defining. Um. At the same time, that shouldn't be like a space to just allow a person to be in the world that's really harmful to yourself or to other people around them and just because, hey, I'm not perfect either. Um, and that can very easily fall into a cognitive trap where we just don't properly stand up for ourselves or even for others sometimes. And we don't stand up for other people because you know, hey, I'm not perfect either. <laughs> um, and it kind of falls into the same idea of like almost just trying their best. It's hard to know if they're really trying their best. And then what does that best look like? And it kind of falls into that same cognitive trap of like it can give people too much space. And sometimes they give people too little space too. <laughs> Oh, yes, absolutely. I think that was actually something recently that... Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, be, let me be more definitive with my language. I know recently that I tried to approach this conversation with someone as we explored life together, and um, I said to them that it's very possible that you're not giving others around you that you care about enough space to be erroneous to to make mistakes to to do things that you disagree with and it it was so strange to me to actually begin to understand that because i can see now right why um individuals uh, why you might experience someone as, as as being very particular or or being very controlling or being very um um uh, very, they can be, they, ex, being around certain people can feel like you're walking in eggshells, you know, um, so, so because they have such a narrow window by, by, by which you can operate with in the world, they don't give you a lot of room for error, you know, and, and it's, um, it's a very, like, high for myself, let me be specific again for all the listeners, for myself when I'm embedded in a relationship like that with someone, um, it causes me to be in a heightened state of constantly questioning um, at my ever at my every motion, you know, because I'm concerned that I'm going to uh, um, offend or hurt or cause some sort of emotional duress in a manner that is like, uh, I, I, you know, I just did not intend to do that. Um, so yeah, th th that narrow window is is challenging. But then to answer to speak to your um, ideas about the larger window of uh, of um, opening up your 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 um, the window by which we offer the level of gratitude we offer others, and then at the same time not 
saying to those individuals like you are definitely out of line and your behavior is destructive it doesn't do any th good either to that individual or yourself you know um now, now, now is that how is so that's where we would set our limits is that correct our limits where exactly uh, when I'm not we, following completely. Uh, when we say here are some individuals or an individual that are doing certain types of things right and because mm -hmm. we've given them a large window to to operate in the world right and they are now demonstrating a behavior that's extremely um, on a higher extreme like unacceptable um, then we set limits mm -hmm. is I'm assuming that's that's what we're talking about when we set those limits Right. Yeah. That would be what we're talking about more here. Definitely. I, okay. So, so when does those limits look like punishment, or I'm doing it because I care? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, maybe put maybe like rewording punishment as consequences might be better. That sounds less. Uh, I'm trying to think of the negative things that come around, like the word punishment to me, <laughs> uh, where consequences, all behavior has consequences. Sometimes if we do really harmful things, the consequences are, uh, you know, we have consequences for it. And you're, you're, sorry, what was your question again? I was trying to figure out when do we set these limits, uh, when, do, when do those limits that we set on the individual when we are, oh. yeah, sorry, go ahead, you, under, you remember now. Look like... Yeah, it looks like punishment, and then the second part was. Oh, or or or. The second part. Right, sure. Uh, punishment or or. Or loving. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yeah. Um, like a rational, compassionate response. It's, it's basically what the loving means to me, at least. I don't know what that means to you, but that would be my interpretation of that. Having a. Can you say that one more time? So having like a, for me, love looks like having a rational, compassionate response to something. There's a lot of things we wrap up in the word love um, or a loving response. So for me, I would see it as rational compassion. Um, yeah, what does that look like? And that's, that's actually the best thing to discuss today, actually. And we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> right. Which, which started this whole discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you're going to want to take into consideration, like, when are you enabling that person to continue a pattern of behavior? It may be you standing up to it that helps them see it and say, okay, I'm going to stop that, and I'm also going to stop doing that to other people. Um, that may be a way of having a very rational, compassionate response versus just allowing the behavior to continue, especially if you see it harms you and it harms other people. Um because you definitely don't want to be enabling people who's being too soft, which is something I've struggled deeply with in my past. Um, just being too too understanding. And I think my understanding, my too understanding was hinged more deeply in just fear of standing up for myself in a healthy way and not having the skills to do so. Um, more than it was actually about the other person and extending empathy to them. It was more about my own internal thing, which would be an interesting thing to explore. That was my personal experience with it when I questioned myself more deeply about why I had this large window where I just allowed people to do things that were really hurting me you know, versus saying that's just too much and being, you know, too understanding. Um, but yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Wow, that's Back to you. yeah, that's a nice that's a nice um that's a really nice way to uh to, to character to frame your uh, your experiences. It's created a, quite a bit of um ideas in my mind. Um for myself, um well hmm. <laughs> part of my silence as I contemplate. Um Yes, <laughs> I understand. I'm also thinking because this is creating a lot of a lot of trains of thought. So I'm like, hmm, <laughs> and I've been putting myself through this process for the past six months pretty hard, like trying to figure out, like, 
where does rational compassion start and begin? And it's very case dependent too. So you kind of feel like learn in the moment to navigate things with high emotional intelligence um, and intelligence. And so, yeah, care. Yeah. So you definitely get, getting me to think a lot too. <laughs> Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm currently just not. <laughs> I don't know if you've like uh, uh, you've you've kind of presented a lot to me, and I feel in, I'm feeling overwhelmed. But that that uh, <laughs> I I do you, can you pare down your um your your narrative again about yourself so I can try to ingest it and uh, create a um okay, create sure. a better response. So, like, from my personal experience of having, like, this large window of empathy work for people and, like, feeling like I was relating to them, a lot of times, if I was able to, like, look at myself, I was, like, I realized it was a lot about myself and not about them um, and my own internal stuff where I was fearful of standing up for myself and saying, no, this is not behavior I accept. I was in the space of um, just not having the skills to also like have a really good conversation that was able to resolve things and those skills have only come within like the past year um, they, they keep increasing but and in being able to see that a lot of my my empathy was really just fear based thinking and sometimes it wasn't so much about understanding the other person as much as I would have liked to lead myself to believe was the case. And that was really challenging for me to process internally and look at myself and self-reflect on it. Um, that's one layer that I've realized was behind my window of empathy and where I was able to realize, like, start differentiating more between empathy and rational compassion. Um, and also like understanding trying to understand why I would choose to make the choices I did when I started looking deeper at my own trauma and what I was processing internally does that make more sense? yes it <laughs> does not more sense, it but, does, uh, it does. Better, a more deeper explanation indeed can you can you elaborate a little bit more about what exactly is rational compassion versus uh, empathy that is fear based so empathy might come from this space of where you're, you, I mean, empathy is a tool, but if, let's say I see someone suffering and I empathize with that and I choose to join to wallow with them and we you know, like, you know, just wallow in pain with them. And I'm in the space where I'm like so supportive of their suffering, but in a way that doesn't help them help them out of it I'm just like with them and we suffer together kind of thing whereas rational compassion says I see you suffering there and I can I can relate but I'm not going to join you in that suffering I'm going to be compassionate in that I'm trying to think better explanation here <laughs> like <clears throat> um <clears throat> So empathy has this space of like trapping us in inaction where co rational compassion can have, this, have us in a space where we start making actual decisions <coughs> that stop enabling people. And while both recognize the suffering, one tends to be more active and the other tends to be more passive and based on a lot more feelings and less about like the rational thought processes and pathways to finding solutions. Oh, I see. That's a good way of wording it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm still getting the language for understanding it completely. Hmm. The process that I'm going through internally myself and also externally in reading and discussing it like conversations like this. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I can I can say that um the idea of just um not enabling somebody, um I, I like where you're going with that. Um I'm not really sure um when I think about e the act of enabling someone, right? Um 
-hmm. We, you know, do we, do we, are we enabling the person by, okay, so I'm sorry, here we go. So some, some, some forms of enabling, right, might look like a, mm -hmm. a delayed space for the person to suffer and then come to a conclusion, right? So you're just kind of like, um, create a, a, a nest, a wound for them to wallow in their experiences, right? Negative experiences that are, that, are, that, that serves them no true purpose over a long period of time, right? That, and then you just need to create a safe space for them to thrive, to, to feel whatever they need to go through the emotions, right? So you're, you're now enabling them. But that kind of enabling is a bit of a delay towards helping them get enough momentum or to like look get past that tr that difficult time to 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 get to a better place uh, you know i don't know if that no did is i that an evening, though? i don't know is it because you're just because anytime you let's say you go through a hard time anytime you have difficult moments there's a processing time and i think just giving a person that space isn't an evening because things don't happen overnight you can't like process the tragedy very quickly it takes a little time um yeah so i think i don't know if that's an enabling at that point that may just be like respecting the process that we go through um so I'm just, let me let me think of an example here let's say <coughs> your friend they lost their job yesterday and you can be in the space of, of um, having compassion, being like, wow, that's really horrible. Um, <clears throat> and you can be supportive of that space as they process all those emotions and they're, they're dealing with that hard time. And while they like collect themselves and say, okay, like in a few days, I'm gonna be back out job hunting and they, you know, get a new job and this, you know, they, they have that time to process that. But let's say your friend, like, six months later, isn't even job hunting, but it's, like, angry. They're in their bedroom. Their finances are falling apart. Um, they just, they haven't processed it well, and they're not helping themselves. At that point, if you're just, like, in the space where you're supportive of that, and that's, like, oh, I'm going to hang out with you, and we're going to drink and like talk and be very bitter about life and your situation and we're just going to complain and we're going to have this conversation week after week after week after week that, at that point you're beginning to enable mm -hmm. does that make sense absolutely so, mm -hmm. like understanding that timeline one is just like respecting the process that we have to go through like in the moment and like kind of regroup and, and figure out an action plan and the other one is like wallowing and that's where empathy and rational compassion can be different where if you say if you're being compassionate you tell your friend you know what i'm not going to sit here and every week we have this same conversation where you're complaining and complaining and complaining and you're not out looking for a job you're not actually doing something to get yourself out of the situation i love you and care about you too much to watch you keep doing this so i can't support it and in that space you know versus being empathetic and just having a pity party with them every week and listening to them complain and then like getting frustrated and then you start getting emotionally drained because you hear them complaining and complaining and complaining all the time and then it starts wearing on your physical and mental and emotional health. Um, those are the difference between where, where empathy can be detrimental and enabling. Yeah. So that process that you were talking about, I guess you have to know the difference when it's like, know the difference between is it just like part of the process or has it turned into like a six month wallowing hmm. and that's when the enabling starts coming into the picture how you respond to what they're going through do you uh, the example you gave uh, was, yeah. really, was really good I, I was I guess I would try to I want to find an example that seems a little bit more challenging. Um, so yeah, yeah, because I, I, I admit that I did choose like a little more um, 
a, a more obvious one. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Which probably we've all had a version of that happen in our life at some point or another. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. The, this the more is... obvious one. <laughs> exactly. The most, <laughs> yeah. It might not have been a job, it might have been something else. <laughs> right, but but definitely more concrete. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, well, I was. Yeah. L let me try to like find a, an example that would be a little bit more... Um, uh, out of the realm of uh, something that's really obvious. Uh, ha. Mm -hmm. Throw one at me. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I'm thinking. Uh, okay, how about this? Um, you have a significant other that decides it... <laughs> this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, you, you have a significant other that, that likes to um, utilize um, language during conflict that says... Um, to, that, that that creates like assertions, right? Like about the other person's um, intention. So uh, again, let me try. Let me explain again. So you have two people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, agent A has a negative experience to Agent B, and Agent B mm -hmm. does this. They they constantly tell Agent A their intention. Versus asking them questions right. about what it is that they're doing, right? And then Agent A decides to push back and say, Hey, I would like to uh, have you ask me questions. I prefer that versus you tell me my intentions, right? Um, and, then, and, and, then, and then Agent A, Agent B says, Well, this is how I have done this in my life, all my life, and everyone around me that I grew up with and currently exist in my life, everyone being like, you know, that word that people use so easily, everyone, it's, it's impossible for everyone, right? but you get the point, like the people that they have experienced mostly, or the ones that are most salient in their minds, you know, um, everyone uh, around me feels that this is this is an acceptable way to communicate, right? So, so now Agent A says, "Well, in 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 the attempt to create harmony between the two of us, right? I'm going to suppress my 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 continued request to not have that be the way that you choose to 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 um, engage me by telling my intention because." I'd rather maintain a harm as much harmony as possible in the, in our interaction moving forward. So anything that's mm -hmm. analogous to you telling my telling me my intention, I'm going to now um, choose to not engage in any conflict and just nod my head in agreement and just move move past that 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 that, that once that thing that was once a conflict. Now to me, right, the enabling. Uh, it, I guess it all depends now on your school of thought, right? So I do not believe that it's a healthy way to be in the world where you tell another person their intention. Um, first off, it's technically impossible for anyone to know another person's intention, let alone some agents themselves can't even self-diagnose to know their own intention. So how could another person get into another person's head and clearly know their intention? That's just absurd to me, right? So... So, so if Agent A says suppresses their their response to try to to articulate against that, are they not at that moment enabling Agent B to maintain their ideas around that and 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 its negative effects? Now again, right? I, I use this example because your data set defines your reality and it defines the way you process the world, the way you process stimuli. So right at this moment, right, Agent B also feels, because they have no examples in their minds, so it's easily, easily retrievable that this type of behavior is negative. And it's just, to them, it's just a, 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 a modality by which you operate in the world. Nothing's wrong with it, and they will not, in any manner, choose to adjust their behavior because 
guess what? If it's not broken, they don't believe that it should be fixed. So to me, that's enabling. Agent A is enabling Agent B, but Agent B and A both feel that their approach to telling someone's intention or not telling someone's intention is totally correct. How do you how do you move forward from there? Because to me, it feels like one one person's enabling, the other one's making concessions, the other one is like uh, um, projecting their values in a way upon the other person, and the other person's just kind of like. Um, you know, I don't really know. It feels it feels very much enabling, not enabling, uh, concessions, um, possibly asking yourself there's a better way to do stuff. doesn't mean the way that you've done it all your life, like Agent B would say, means that it's the right thing to do, you know? I mean, because, you've, because it's, cause it's right to you, it doesn't mean it's always, that that's the right way to do it, is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. Thing. We've always done it this way. It's a, that's a scary thing when we think that way and don't question why we do things. Correct. And those and yeah, those types um, of things are things I talk about that create enabling. When you interact with another person, you let them let them remain in that space. Yeah, yeah. Agent A is enabling and sacrificing and compromising definitely in that in that situation. Yeah, so definitely enabling. Um, and I guess that comes to the space of like, how many compromises can you make for how long? <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, where's that threshold? Because <laughs> usually if there's one thought process that's a little off, then it bleeds into other areas. <laughs> it doesn't stop just there. You're probably making many compromises. Um, but yeah, that one's a tough one, right? And that's where's your own personal threshold. Because that does fall into violent communication, too. Yes, it sure does. And the other, yeah, and I guess what you've described, too, is a, it's a deep-rooted behavioral pattern because it's, you know, something you've done your whole life, and then suddenly you're being told to, maybe you should do it this way, um, to shift that behavior pattern takes a moment if somebody is willing to do the work and if they aren't going to see that how harmful it can be and how much distress it causes another person or they don't fully care then what is why should they change um or they don't fully understand it and then there will likely not be change so agent a will definitely need to be in the space of compromising hmm. if they're trying to not have conflict often about it and I so yeah that's a really that's a tough one yeah <laughs> you're right I didn't mean to interrupt. no not at all uh, and that's what I was thinking about when um, when I look at some of these examples right um, what I end up seeing is it's these it's it's these weird spaces where as as we deal with people that we can that we experience um, violating us in different ways, right? We kind of make these concessions, right? And um, sometimes these concessions, well, let's say let's say for instance, Agent A decided that um, they required just a little bit more time with agent B and, and, and possibly searching for the right way to, um, to, to engage them in a manner that allows for them to agent B to, uh, see the behavior itself, to look at the behavior itself more objectively and to like, um, I guess basically I could think I'm creating an argument for empathy really. Um, you know, how do, how do we get to that place where in transgressions, right? How do we create empathy? As in, the onus is not just on one side, it's on both sides to to establish um, new pattern and pattern in that is more reflective of like um, accountability for the other individual's experience and feelings. Um, so that way we can um, cre expedite how, how quickly we um, get towards 
any sort of connection that is deeper, meaningful, and loving. Um, you know, I mean, how do we do that if the empathy or the cultivation of an empathetic experience is not there? Um, you know, we're going to end up with a slight bit of a challenge where if too much concessions, too many concessions are made, then there are moments, teaching moments that are gone. Um, there could be a, a, a building of resentment, which undermines the relationship anyway. So it doesn't work out well on a long term, right? Possibly. Um, we are also experiencing conditions that might um, thwart um, a higher level of like um, uh, individual transcend in their situation and their experiences. So, you know, we're, basically we are forfeit in their capacity to become, or the the group, the individual, the or the or the two to or more to become better than wh who they are at this moment. Um, so, in some sense, uh, when you give a large window to support people, you risk losing that opportunity to teach you 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 miss that opportunity to m move forward together in a manner that allows for both participants to grow in a way that gives them a better sense of self um mm -hmm. you know i don't know yeah good talk yeah I like that better sense of self <laughs> <laughs> and, and more awareness of things going on around them and how our how we impact others. Yes. Yeah, true. Good teaching tools too. Yeah. That's I'm I'm processing everything you just said. <laughs> Taking a moment. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Um. I don't really have a comeback for that one. I mean, that was like mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, and I, fed, I, I feel that this is where we start to begin to discover, um, you know, the, the complexities in, in, in trying to establish what we would consider um, appropriate boundaries, right? Boundaries that are not too narrow, that the individuals, every most people around you will feel uh, diff difficult, experience difficulties interacting with you, right? Um, broad enough boundaries so that you allow for people to be, to, to meet them where they are, right? But yeah. but then at the same time too, um, not too much because then to not have some limits, to not be confrontational in some manner doesn't allow for uh, you know rational compassion it just allows for empathy that comes from fear um you know fear of conflict fear of loss because of uh you know you're not interested in, in, in engaging and then also um you know these teaching moments that really occur when we are able to look at ourselves objectively look at others look at the situation and and and, and extract an experience that is more in lines with a shared reality versus like our like very much skewed perspective on ourselves and the world if we don't have others to reflect back upon mm -hmm. you know um, um, and then also when we have this broader windows of allowance for people to meet them where they are are we not also at the same time um, compromising our ability to, um, uh, to, 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 to to teach, to create moments of deep, meaningful, like, uh, opportunities to learn, you know? I, I, I don't know. Absolutely. You know, it's just like you cannot do whatever you want in life. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I like that. Seeing things could be as, as teaching tools and like life lessons and experiences. Um, because yes, we cannot just have like this massive window of operation because there will always be people to move in that 
will take advantage of that too because they know you have that space in that state in that large window we'll be careful of that um so yeah that's a Yeah, damn. Again, <laughs> spot on. Yeah. Where does that window begin and end, or where should it begin and end? Yes. And then it's easy to see <laughs> see as we look at both extremes the the um you know the shortcomings of each 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 approach. Um, again, you know that 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 more centrist approach would be a little bit in lines with um actually you know i don't want to put words in your mouth like i i I think it's kind of like an organic progression now in this conversation to try to like um have you share with me and other listeners uh what do you believe a balanced approach to uh engaging with individuals that might that you might be experiencing in a manner that is um difficult and uh how do you set those limits what do those limits look like uh, when do you decide that you should um um you know minimize contact extricate yourself set limits allow them the space that they need um in, in, you know a, approach uh any sort of like um movement towards rational compassion like what, what how would you define like a if you were to give someone a nice tightly packaged as best as you can approach to this that's, oh that's good um and i feel like i've like personally reached such a space of um not being attached to how people are and giving them and being in a space where i can easily uh, i don't know that's a tough one for me because i i just think give people a lot of space without being too close to them to like protect myself and like keep those boundaries and a good way to like do that for me personally I have found is using historical data um behavioral patterns and like really looking at that like not looking at it from how I want them to be but to how they have presented themselves up until that present moment and seeing you know is there real genuine change has there been real genuine amends has there been um if they have said they will change and they have demonstrated some do they revert back to their behavior again um I just really try to look at the overall picture and say, okay, I understand there's a lot of things going on that I don't have control over, and I can mostly only control, I most, I don't want to use the word control, I, the only space I really have some place where I feel like I can say a lot is my interactions with them one-on-one, I don't really get involved with like how they interact with other people um and hmm, this is a tough one (laughs) this is a tough like how do you my general overview how i deal with it personally because each each person does these things so differently and i i haven't like figured out which is the right or wrong way yet myself um But being able to understand, like, from my position, like, where where exactly is my threshold? What am I willing to compromise and sacrifice? Where am I willing to say this is hurting my emotional health too much? After examining and trying to self-reflect really hard, and then also talking to other people about it, and I have some amazing life coaches and therapists in my life, and people that I deeply respect that I can talk to, um who that who I know will call me out and they won't like um just defend my side because they're super biased they will actually you know tell me when I'm doing things that are that don't appear to be the best um 
and being able to understand where my thresholds lie and from there say this is behavior I don't accept when you're interacting with me and then really just being not attached to what they choose to do um, otherwise and also being in a space where I can be very like I've forgiven it I'm not holding on to that resentment because holding on to all those emotions internally doesn't feel good for any of us I'm learning to process all of that and just let it go essentially um, and just really dealing with reality as it is and which that's that's a good one to discuss too because I'm also processing through my biases and other people's biases um, <laughs> which would be another video uh, sorry another audio blog um, so I guess it's trying to take all that data and really thinking about it deeply and seeing the complexities of it and then just deciding to sum it up and then deciding what I personally, where my thresholds lie when my physical, emotional, mental health is being too harmed um, and then sticking to those boundaries as much as I can and, and still not really, I guess for me, it's like, I don't fully cut people off in a way that I never talk to them again. Um, I mean, you have to do something really terrible for me to, to get to that point. <laughs> um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that they're, like, in my life a lot or have, like, a lot of space for me. I feel respect and allowance into my inner world is very much earned by behavior that is the, the person is demonstrating that they do um, have my best interest at heart too and they're demonstrating behavior that is healthy enough and pretending how healthy that behavior is, is is the scale for how close I allow them to be to me and have like any sort of influence in my life or yeah is that a, I don't know that was a lengthy explanation but that's my personal conclusion that I reach for myself um yeah so I don't know if that answers your question I think well, I think the qu I think the question itself is never going to have an easy answer you know um so I appreciate you uh, trying to answer it to the best of your ability. Um, I'll take a stab at it since you went. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say to improve, the individual should improve themselves by understanding how people suffer. I mean, there are a lot of great literature out there to, uh, mm -hmm. to begin to... Uh, help people understand that and to look at that. Um, there are also, um, you know, other forms of um, literature that also begins to share ways to look at people and the way that they struggle in life and um, t t to to not condemn them, you know. Um, I, I, I quoted earlier in the very, very, very part, first opening part of this, conversation uh, a book uh, written by Dale Carnegie um, how to win friends and influence people I think that's a great place to start if anybody were to like uh, listen to this audio blog and try to understand how they can um, look at people and just be a little bit more uh, compassionate with their approach um, so I would say invest in yourself understand a little bit more about people human behavior that's going to be a lifelong topic you can never ever yes, you can never end end the research in that area so I'd say start that journey now uh, second um, really incorporate some some ideas that I encountered through other people and their um, experiences with Buddhism uh, that idea being um, respect the journey don't attach yourself to the end result 
um, when I first started these interactions with people and myself, my internal process, um, I too was attached too heavily to the, to the end result of what I wanted, the kind of change that I thought was going to happen, and, and then I would get irritated as it didn't happen or it wasn't happening fast enough. And that was a mistake I made over and over again with loving people that I found difficult. Um, so change your perspective around what you consider a proper timeline and what a, and what a proper end result looks like and, and put more emphasis on the journey itself because all journeys don't end at the same place. Um, mm -hmm. a, another thing I would say is to, it's to uh, look at um, I would say gain expand the capacity move towards greater allowances for individuals that are consider that you might consider challenging in your life um, expand that some more um, part what I noticed was the more that I was able to embrace those individuals um, I was able to uh, be more compassionate in the world less frustrated in the world in some ways because I can see now that more people were suffering than, than I was aware of. Um, so it, it, it increased my scope of awareness by, by surrounding myself around, surrounding myself with more people that were suffering. Uh, next, uh, I would say um, to create a network of other individuals that you can reach out to to support yourself when you feel that what you're experiencing is just a little too painful for you to endure by yourself and that has goes back to the, the micro traumas you know really talk about them a lot with others that are that are able to support you because those individuals are going to be the ones gonna that will help minimize the negative effects of like what that those micro traumas kind of build up to to become these larger traumas um so get a nice support network of people that you can reach out to and people that are not um in, not, not not ditto chamber people you know you don't want people that are just going to nod their heads in agreement with you that's just like the worst yes. collection of people you can surround yourself with you know um, and i think you know this quite well your 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 explanation your answer earlier was really reflective of that um so you want to engage with people that are going to help you engage even more accurately and 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 definitely continuously outside of your comfort um and then um just 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 you know uh say to yourself you know when you're having these challenging experiences if that person you know if they if they are not a child imagine that adult as a child and say to yourself if this behavior was from a child right what are some of the things that you would do to enhance the opportunity for that child to become a better person or to look at the world a little differently and i think when you can start to see the child within the adult it's one of the most liberating things that can happen to you as an individual moving through the world trying to like navigate challenging individuals and the and, and, the, and the things that they bring in, into our and into our um, into inter, inter interactions with each with each with each other so that's that's the best I can come up with with an answer for that question and the topic itself like that yeah yeah do you, do you rec some good ones. yes do you have any um anything that you would recommend as a as a great r place to start with for people to read to help them look at this oh. <laughs> um, this particular topic let me see we're talking about compassion i feel like a large just just for difficult relationships in general and trauma is really usually what makes them difficult um not the end you you are the one of the people who talk a lot about critical thinking too I feel definitely like read about critical thinking, but also uh, read things on trauma. And the books I would recommend would be The Fantasy Bond by um, Robert Firestone. That's like probably my 
my top recommended book on understanding trauma in family and romantic relationships and even friendships. It covers everything. It just covers uh, trauma and relationships uh, really, really well. That's probably the number one book I would recommend to understand the suffering that we endure in relationships. And he also writes other phenomenal books like Fear of Intimacy. I think he has several books on, or at least one, maybe not several, book, a book on death, which I have not written, read yet. But he covers the existential anxieties that, um, that really cause a lot of difficult interactions, our fears, our desires that are very much hinged on that. Um, so I think of, I think David, uh, sorry, Robert Firestone is the author that I would most recommend to really get started on reading and understanding people's responses and relationships better. And he's done over 30 years of work on the subject and is and studied multiple generations of people. So he's he has some really amazing insights to offer and he's also a clinical psychologist, I believe. And yeah, that would be like the that would be where I would start. <laughs> it's they're tough reads, but if you can if you can read them it will it will be life life changing and completely alter the way you see relationships and interacting with um, people that are difficult. Well, there you go. Um, that's Darlene's uh, recommendation. You heard mine. Uh, it's Dale Carnegie's um, How to Win Friends and Influence. That's a good place to start. And uh, you just heard uh, Darlene's uh, recommendation. Uh, Darlene, can you just uh, share with us again how we can contact you and uh, where you are? Because I think that we're at a good closing up point, uh, unless you have anything else that you want to say. I think that covered, we covered a lot for today. <laughs> There's a lot more to cover too. But uh, I think I think that I'd be, I think I pretty much said everything that I can think of at the moment. <laughs> We've had a lot of discussions, so my brain's quite tired. <laughs> um, you can find me at Darlene Zim, Z-I-M-M, on Facebook, and also Metano Healing Arts on both Facebook and Instagram. And Metano is spelled M-E-T-A-N-I-O-A. Great. You've... Uh, my name is uh, Lex Peters, and uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Motion Design Studio. That's uh, Motion Design Studio. All right. Thanks a lot, listeners. I hope that you had a great um, experience. I hope that the last hour and 17 minutes was uh, something that you felt gave you a little bit more insight or at least start the journey and move you towards uh, gaining a better understanding of your relationships with others and your conflicts and where where do you begin and end to support those individuals um i for one have struggled with that immensely and i feel that my 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 answers are not really um anything concrete but they're actually just experiences that are ongoing uh, moving targets basically so um i'm sure if we were to talk together darlene and i about this or some of our other friends uh, we would end up with very different conclusions on things but at, at, at any one moment in time it's better to like start this conversation than not that's all i can share with you so don't be afraid to like look deeply at rational compassion don't get um, caught up in empathy that has uh, you know that's fair based thinking uh, and definitely um, don't fear conflict and definitely increase your, your your emotional quotient and intellectual quotient so you can become more skilled at engaging individuals in that create these types of conflicts for us all right Thanks, everyone, and uh, I hope that uh, you tune in the next time. If you have any uh, comments or questions, please uh, go ahead and write them below, and uh, I'm sure we can either uh, incorporate them in our next show or actually respond to them directly. All right. 
thanks a lot, and uh, it's been a pleasure.